today's webinar thank you today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the ncap website via our youtube channel everyone who registered for today's session will receive a link to this recording and a copy of the slides and supplemental materials by email today's presentation is being conducted in meeting mode because we want to encourage our network to get to know one another Please be sure that your name and organization are reflected on screen and take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat if you can. We also encourage dialogue. Please post questions in the chat, in the Q&A tab, or use the raise hand function if you'd like to ask out loud. My coworker Steph Smith will be fielding questions. I can't get the slide to advance. Okay, whoops. Now, um, as we do with all community action events, we'd like to join in reading the promise of community action. You can unmute and do this out loud with us if you'd like. The promise of community action. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. Thank you. Today, I am very pleased to introduce Carla Potts. Carla is a certified community action professional and has been with the Northeast Community Action Corporation for over 40 years. Her current title is Deputy Director for Housing Development. She also serves as Vice Chair of the Missouri Weatherization Policy Advisory Committee and Vice Chair of the Missouri Energy and Housing Professional Alliance. Carla was instrumental in developing the first Healthy Homes Program in Missouri, which was the subject of an NCAP webinar several years ago. In her spare time, Carla has also served as mayor and alderman in her hometown of Ellsbury. Today, Carla is going to tell us how her agency is running a paid apprenticeship program to onboard new weatherization crew members. They have hired four employees so far and have 30 new recruits in the pipeline from their local vocational high school. She will explain how they spark interest in this line of work by emphasizing the construction aspects and illustrate how these new jobs fit into the regional labor market in her part of the country. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Carla. Thank you, Amy. Um, I'm glad to be with all of you today. Um, I guess good afternoon or good morning, depending on what part of the country you're from. But in Missouri, we have a beautiful um, almost spring day. So I'll start out by just telling you a little bit about Northeast Community Action Corporation. Um, we serve 12 counties in Northeast Missouri. Um, we have rural counties and they're listed. And then we have three metropolitan counties with one of them adjacent to the city of, of St. Louis, uh, the county of St. Louis. Our agency's budget, um, and I did, and it just came up and I, I meant to say as a community action agency, we of course have county service centers in each one of those counties who provide services directly to the people that I always say that we are blessed to serve. Our budget is to over $26 million, which makes us one of the largest in the state of Missouri. We operate 60 different programs. We have 30 different funding sources, I guess 30 plus as we add some it seems like often, which is a good thing. We have 110 full-time employees and we have 200 part-time employees as we run a large in-home services program. Um, we serve thousands of clients as all of you do with a variety of our programs. So um, as, as Amy said, I've been with the agency 44 years. Um, I used to say I started when I was five 
and um, people seem not to believe that. Um, so I'll just not say when I started, but it's 44 years ago. Um, so that's a little background on NECAC and our history as a community action agency. And I always say, Amy had us read the promise, but when we say community action agency, that means something. That means something to the clients we serve and the communities we serve and the work that we do that improves not only the lives of people, but our communities as a whole. Thanks, Carla. Are you ready for the next slide? I am. So little background. As we all know, it's hard to find employees. Um, and I see a lot of Missouri people on this call and thank you all for joining too. I appreciate it. You heard my story and I appreciate you joining to hear my story again. But as we talk about in Missouri, it is hard to find employees. Um, it seems like we put out ads and we don't get many that apply or many who are interested in, in what we do. And so it's a very difficult task for all of us. We um, you know, have a lower minimum wage in Missouri at $9 an hour. McDonald's is now paying $15 an hour with in here in Bowling Green, a large sign as you drive into their parking lot saying $15 an hour. Um, we have, um, of course, Amazon, we have a distribution center in one of our counties. So we know that their wages are at 17. I was just telling um, Amy before we started that Target, who is only in one of our large counties, St. Charles, is looking at starting at $24. It's hard to compete with those wages. So what do we do? And then we know what union contractors pay. So what do we do? Well, what we do is we have to think proactively. We have to think outside the box. If what we're doing now isn't working, then what can we do that will work? Um, we know that weatherization, we know what a great program it is. Amy and I were talking that if you didn't see the State of the Union last night, President Biden called out weatherization by name um, in reference to tax credits, but nevertheless, he called out our program by name. So we know what an excellent program it is. We know what excellent training that we give our employees. Marla, can you, can you tell us a little bit about how weatherization works in your agency? Sure. Um, I suspect weatherization at NECAC works pretty similar to weatherization everywhere else. Um, and my Missouri friends, I know we work exactly the same. Um, weatherization works that we take the application when they come up on the waiting list. And Amy, is this what you want to know? Um, um, just, uh, however, if you could tie it in with the slide, so how you're funded, what your production sure. numbers are, sure. whether you're crew or contractor, et cetera. Sure, I will do that. I did want to talk just a little bit more, though, about thinking outside the box and thinking about these are not just jobs. These are careers. And we have to think in terms of marketing what we do as these are careers. These are careers that have an impact on our customers, they have an impact on our communities, and they certainly have an impact on our environment. And so at the next slide, we receive, um, of course, Department of Energy money through the Missouri um, Department of Natural Resources. And I noted that Robert was on, I don't know anyone else, but I saw Robert's name. We receive LIHEAP funding, we receive utility funds, some coming directly to the state, others coming directly from the utility companies. And we're in line now to receive some extra American um, Recovery Act LIHEAP funds. Um, we receive a little over $2 million. Um, overall, with all of the programs that we operate, we serve about 200 homes a year. We are crew based. Um, we even have our own furnace um, installer as an employee. So we can do our own installation of furnaces, our own clean and tunes, all of that. We thought instead of subcontracting out all of that, why not bring it in house? 
Um, however, as we continue to grow, which is a great thing, um, we're going to have to go back to subcontracting out some of that because it's um, beyond the ability of one person to do. So we do um, subcontract out at times um, the furnace installations and the clean and tunes. Right now, we have a wait list of 435 people. Um, we average about 10 to 15 applications per day from our county service centers. And they do a wonderful job of selling weatherization. If people come in for energy assistance, they talk about the need for them to apply for weatherization to be able to um, better able better able to meet their utility bills. Um, we know that 435 is not enough for the new money that is coming, but it's a great start with the new money that is coming. Um, with the new money and the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill, we're anticipating about 4.5 million for NECAC, and we don't have exact numbers yet, but anticipating in that area. Um, roughly, we think that's about 500 more homes, um, and we're looking at adding at least 30 new crew laborers. Um, and Amy asked me to talk just a little bit about NECAC has three distinct departments, um, divisions. We have a community services division, which covers CSVG, LIHEAP, energy assistance, um, those programs. We have a community health program um, division that has in-home services, WIC, and family planning. And then we have the division that I oversee, and that's housing development. And under weather is that we have weatherization, we have home rehabilitation, we have healthy homes, um, we have uh, home ownership programs and foreclosure programs, but we also own a portfolio of multifamily properties. Um, we own over 1,400 units of affordable housing across all of our counties plus some. So our position as a housing development agency really, I think, lends itself to supporting weatherization and, of course, the apprenticeship program. Thank you so much, Carla. Uh -huh. So now to talk about the apprenticeship program itself. Well, the apprenticeship program is a one-year program. It is a registered apprenticeship program of the, the U.S. Department of Labor. And I will also mention that President Biden last night mentioned apprenticeship programs. Um, and we have some, we'll talk some later about the number of apprentices in this country and how that number continues to go up. Um, we devised the curriculum and how we would do the training. <clears throat> we have 144 hours of classroom and 2,000 on the job training. And that's just what we're doing now. None of this is any different than what we're already doing with our employees. We were already providing them this kind of training. So we just simply put that into a proposal to the Department of Labor, <clears throat> along with what we would do and how many hours that would take. So we do some general construction, we do workplace safety. And if you do weatherization, all of these sound very familiar. We do weatherization tech. What does it mean to be a weatherization technician? Asbestos and mold. The category, and I told Amy that this morning, and <clears throat> I'm going to take just a quick drink as I seem to want to cough, and I've not wanted to cough all day until right at this very moment. Um, when I talk to you, and, and his name will come up, Wade Johnson with the uh, Missouri office, of the Department of Labor and said, we want to be a, we want to, we want to look at an apprenticeship program. And I will tell you that we didn't know a whole lot about that. Um, but sounded like something that might be a benefit to not only our agency, but to the people we will hire. And he immediately knew weatherization and immediately knew of the thousands of categories that the Department of Labor has, where to put it home performance labor residential. Now the apprenticeship program works just like what you would think. The people, we hire the 
the people, they work, they are NECAC employees. We started $13 an hour and um, we're looking right now at adjusting our wages. Our board will meet this month to um, hopefully approve the, the wage adjustments and we'll be going to $16 an hour for our entry level weatherization technicians. One of the really selling points that we use is that our crews work for four um, days, 10 hours. So they work Monday through Thursday and they're off on Friday. If they want to work on Friday, they can, but you know, it's nice to have that three day um, weekend. And so it's been a real selling point for the people that we've um, hired. Um, we pay 100% health insurance and that includes dental and vision. And we also have a retirement account that they um, can choose to pay in or not, but NECAC will contribute to their retirement account. Um, yes, I can speak to the top wages um, in just a moment. Um, they start out as crew laborers, but like I said, we um, view this as a career, not a job. Um, and not a job. And so they can train and get education to become a quality control inspector and auditor. So they have the opportunity to grow in their jobs. I think the question was about the top wages. Um, we're adjusting all of our wages. Um, we're going up to um, some of ours will go up. Everybody will go up about $2. So an auditor will go to 18. Um, QCI will go to uh, 20. So all of our wages will adjust. Um, and we'll do this across the board because, you know, you don't want to bring people on and they're making more than people who are already there. So everybody's wage will adjust. Um, and I, I saw one of the questions is how do we pay the apprentices? These are NECAC employees. Um, they're paid through the, the funds from weatherization programs. Um, they just are in as a registered apprentice getting that training. Um, so they're paid through just like any other weatherization employee. They're paid by whichever program that they're showing as working in. I think we do have some another part on another slide where we talk about the breakdown, how you use your payroll to figure out which um, which parts of the job are billed to which revenue stream. Okay. On, on this slide, um, we have some screenshots from the Department of Labor Apprenticeship website that lay out exactly how they categorize the position that you're using this home performance laborer residential. Um, so we would encourage everybody to go to apprenticeship.gov and look up this particular occupation if you're interested. I was wondering, Carla, if you could talk about some of the different names for this kind of work, because we can see on this screen that this particular position lays out a whole different, uh, like a whole laundry list of tasks that contribute to this particular occupation. But then on the left, it talks about alternative titles energy administrator, field technician, weatherization and housing inspector, weatherization installer. And while you were talking, I know at one point we, you referred to the workers as crew laborers, but in other places, sometimes you call them weatherization um, crews and there's different words that you use. Mm -hmm. So um, can you talk a little bit about how you decide which terminology to use and what's most appealing to your prospective workforce? Yeah, um, when we market, um, when we market it, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into advertising for the job, we have, um, you know, put it as weatherization technician, weatherization installer, we put it as entry level carpentry, anything that we think will make someone say to that ad, I'm interested in that. I think mm -hmm. I have those skills. It all comes back, we always, within the body of the ad, always show weatherization. But how do we phrase it where people don't just go past the ad and not and think, well, I can't do that, or I don't know what that is. Um, the home performance labor, DOL chose that one 
rather than all of these other titles um, for this particular job um, based on what we said they would learn. Um, so they chose that, but I think I think it's, you know, it's back to thinking outside the box. It's back to thinking mm -hmm. about if I'm reading an ad and it says weatherization crew labor, weatherization technician, and I'm not sure what weatherization is. And mm -hmm. I hate to say that people don't know, but there's still people who don't. Um, am I just going to click on that and say, I don't know what that is. And so I'm not going to apply. But if we say something about carpentry and they say, well, I can do carpentry or I have some of those skills. And then in the body of the ad, it talks about weatherization. So mm -hmm. I think it's just that thinking outside the box and thinking about how to position yourself to even get someone in the door to apply for what you have open. Um, we know that they're learning valuable skills but we have to get them to us to be able to talk about that. Amy, I wanted to go back a little bit though. And when we were talking about the registered apprenticeship program, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk a little bit about, we partnered with our um, workforce investment board. And I know, I know that Robert's working, Robert Garber with, with Missouri Department of Natural Resources, working with the state and other workforce investment boards but, you know, I went to them first saying, I'm going to have to hire all these people and I have trouble now hiring one or two and I'm going to look at 30. What am I going to do? Um, so sometimes thinking out of the box is, you know, going to somebody else and saying, you know, we need some help. And so they wrote a grant um, for a pre-apprenticeship program. Well, let's uh, move on to the next slide because in this slide okay. we'll talk about the process of getting this up and running. So thanks, Amy, for keeping oops. me on track. Sure. Um, I think we already covered some of these bullets, right? Can you can you talk about how you got the apprenticeship registered? Um, and you already talked about the recruitment and stuff, but we did. We we made a call to um, the Department of Labor, Wade Johnson, whose name will come up as a Missouri contact and said, you know, we're really interested in this. Um, the state workforce, the state um, office also said, you need to become a registered apprenticeship program. And so we thought, well, we think that's true. And we think it's a real advantage and a real selling point to what we're doing and highlighting weatherization. And so we thought this is gonna probably take a very long time and it's probably gonna have a lot of paperwork and um, we would be wrong. Um, it took us exactly 30 days to get registered with the Department of Labor. We filled out the application that they had. We um, did our training outline mm -hmm. of what would be classroom and what would be on the job training and submitted all of that. And within 30 days, we had a certification as an approved Missouri registered apprenticeship program. So if you're out there and you think this is going to take a long time, this is going to be a lot of paper, do I really want to do this? This is a seamless process um, with the Department of Labor. So um, don't let that be a standing block. And it says we formalized the training work we already do. It's exactly what we did. We already do this training. All of you who do weatherization, train your staff on all of these things now. We just formalized it into a document. Did you have to change any of your training procedures in order to get registered or is it exactly the same things that you were already doing? It's exactly the same things we were already doing. Exactly. When we interview and we talk about the registered apprenticeship program, I have to tell you that everybody that we've interviewed and I'll talk a little bit about the Pike Lincoln Tech Center here in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, everybody that we interview or talk to is excited about this registered apprenticeship program. That certification from the Department of Labor at the end of one year is a really valuable thing. Um, you know, we're hoping they stay with us for a career, but if they don't, 
or they move and go, you know, somewhere else, they have that Department of Labor certification. Mm -hmm. um, it is a, uh, we talked a little bit about, a little bit about um, rolling admission. We're hiring, we actually are interviewing again this week um, just to continue to try to add staff not having to add 30 people in say July or August, but try to add as we go along so we can get people trained. Mm -hmm. And um, instead of having, you know, 30 brand new employees, uh, we have four trainees that have been hired so far and they will soon in a few months complete their certification and get their cert get their certificate. Um, can you talk a little bit about the partnership with the Northeast Missouri Workforce Development Board? I can. And that'll lead me into what I was trying to talk about with pre-apprenticeship. So thank mm -hmm. you again for keeping me on track. As I said, we reached out to them and said, we have to hire all these people. And, you know, we have difficulty hiring people. And can you help us? And they said, absolutely. They were willing to help. Um, and I think you'll find that with every um, workforce development board that they're willing to help. Anyway, they wrote a grant um, for a pre-apprenticeship program. Um, I don't know about everyone on this call, but sometimes we uh, find some of the employees we hire, not only in weatherization, but across the board, don't have some of the basic skills that we assume they have. Um, showing up to work on time, getting along with coworkers, they don't have them. And so, you know, if you don't train those kind of skills, it's really hard to blame a person for not having them if they were never taught it. So the Pike Lincoln Tech Center is teaching um, all of those pre-employment skills. Um, the, Pi the Missouri Workforce Development, or the Northeast Workforce Development Board can pay um, the Pike Lincoln Tech Center during that time for that training for the for their students, both adult and um, seniors, juniors and seniors in high school. But they'll come out with some of those basic, they'll come out with their OSHA 10 also, but they'll come out with those basic skill sets. And then they're referred to us for an interview and to entry into the registered apprenticeship program. That's very exciting. Um, yeah. I understand also that, do we have someone from the Missouri Department of Natural Resources on the call today? Um, because I heard in a meeting with Wade Johnson that um, they are, there are other agencies in Missouri that are launching similar programs um, through the state partnering with the state workforce development board. Can anybody report on that? Because that's sort of like new breaking news that's exciting. Hi, Amy. This is Robert Garber from Missouri Department of Natural Resources. Hi. Hi. Um, we are, we're currently working with the um, Department of Workforce Development um, at the state. Um, we need to have a um, to do to do a statewide program, we need to have a sponsor, and um, uh, our division, our department is not. Um, we don't feel like we have the staffing to be the sponsor right now, and so we're also working with the Missouri Community Action Network, um, and we're trying to figure out a way that between the two of us we can sponsor a statewide program. We just don't have those logistics figured out quite yet, um, but we are working on that because we would like for this to be a statewide program. Mm -hmm. um, the nice thing about it is, is that um, each individual agency would have its own apprenticeship program. Um, uh, the, the setup, um, the pay rates, everything would be individualized to the individual agency but we would just be a conduit um, for um, helping them get that program set up and for um, possibly reporting um, and uh, you know, any other ways that we could help out. Um, 
uh, on a state level. Great, thank you. I think um, NASCASP in their conference also emphasized the importance of engaging with your state office. And one of the things that we'll share with our attendees at the end of the session of today's session is a spreadsheet that was developed by NASCASP that lists the contact person for every state workforce development board so that our attendees today can reach out and find out how to if they don't already know how to connect with either their state or their local workforce development board. Because as Carla's process illustrates, an individual agency can work with an individual local workforce development board, but there is also the option to do these partnerships at the state level. All right, Carla, would you like to tell us about your first graduate? I can, um, as you can see, he's um, busily working there. Um, he had some basic construction skills, um, but was very excited about the apprenticeship program. And I'm not going to read his quote, but, um, you know, he did say, this is really just going to jumpstart his skills to do his job better. So he was very excited about this opportunity, as all of them had been very excited. And I do want to talk, I talked about the Missouri Workforce, or the Northeast Missouri Workforce Development Board, and Robert, thank you for sharing that. Um, I also want to emphasize your vocational technical schools. Um, we're utilizing Pike Lincoln Vocational Technical School. Um, they bring a lot to the table. They're doing a lot of the training. They have a building trades program in most of the schools. I would suspect all of the vocational technical schools. And the executive director of Pike Lincoln, and I do just want to read his quote. He said, this is such a good program. Weatherization, the registered apprenticeship, all of it combined. This is such a great program. And he said, if I was graduating high school, I would jump at the chance to get a job where I can learn, I can grow, I can start a career and I can get a certification. And those 30 that we're looking at in the pipeline, some of those are gonna be graduating high school seniors um, who will graduate in May. But what a wonderful opportunity. So, you know, don't discount or don't pass by your vocational technical schools. Um, they are a wealth of, of knowledge and information. And I, I like the fact that you're working with high school students as well, because that's something that has come up in other webinars and other um, venues when we talk to the network is the importance of working with youth, right? Um, because like our friends at IRAC have the Green Buildings career map that shows how entry-level positions can lead to a long-term career in, in uh, you know, like building science. It, it's, uh, it's especially attractive to new graduates. Absolutely, and Steph, I did hear him say that community colleges were really kind of the unsung um, people in the nation. I would I would say that the vocational technical schools are right there with that. And Xavier, thank you for your words too. Um, so anyway, I, Amy, I think I'm ready for the next slide. Okay, good. Um, before we move on, do we have any questions from the chat that haven't been answered or haven't been addressed? This seems like a good point to break for that. I don't think so. I think we're okay. um, making them as they roll in. Great. Um, so this is content that I received from Wade Johnson. He's Carla's partner in this endeavor. And I really like this graphic. So I asked Carla if we could insert it into the presentation. Um, it lays out the steps for becoming a registered apprenticeship. And I know Carla said that it's a it, it took less than 30 days and it was a piece of cake. Um, they're a large agency that already did a lot of training. They were just formalizing, you know, writing up stuff that they were already doing. Um, for other agencies that may be looking at more ramping up to, to, to become an apprenticeship, this, is, this slide breaks down exactly what you have to do. The first thing you have to do, of course, is contact your local Department of Labor office. So um, Mr. Johnson gave us permission to put his contact information up here. If anybody wants to reach out to him for help connecting with the one that serves your area, feel free. Otherwise, you can also locate these folks at apprenticeship.gov. Um, Carla, would you like to talk
talk about, again, you said that you had to, can you walk us through again the process of developing that plan? I can. Um, well, we certainly out, started out with contacting them um, and contacting them, you know, having a little bit of knowledge, but not a lot of knowledge, but, mm -hmm. you know, just to, just that thinking out of the box and thinking, you know, I think we can do this. Um, we're community action, right? Uh, we can do anything. One thing I'd like to highlight on this slide is that from the Department of Labor perspective, your agency is an employer, right? That's the important Correct. thing. Um, so they're not looking at you as needing help from them. They're looking at you as providing an employment service for, for the public because you're hiring people. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we started out contacting and we were very lucky to, to get hold of Mr. Johnson and um, who was wonderful and um was very easy to work with and um, we didn't even have we didn't have a meeting um we already had our partners in place mm -hmm. um so and we as i said if you provide if you do weatherization you already have the training in place you just mm -hmm. need to formalize it so we did that um we got our registration in um and we began hiring people now I make that, and Amy said, "piece of cake." I make that sound like a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the time, I probably didn't think it was quite as much of a piece of cake, but it still was not difficult. It was not difficult, and they're very easy to work with, and they, you know, take a multitude of questions um, from someone who, you know, was not real familiar with registered apprenticeship programs, mm -hmm. and probably knew enough to be dangerous. Um, and so, and they, you know, we have, they have a system that you register the apprentices on, mm -hmm. really easy system to access. They sent the login for that. One, the time they sent us. Yes, Amy. Yeah. One thing I'd like to ask about in this flow chart is number six and seven. It looks like you have to hire the apprentices first and then register them. That's what, correct. how does, do you know why it's structured that way? And is that a good structure or it, it seems to me like if I were looking to hire apprentices, I would think that you had to register them first and then hire them. So you have to hire people and then register them. Correct. Is Correct. there any chance that you would hire somebody and not be able to register them or? No, the only the only thing would be if they didn't want to be registered as an apprentice, you know, mm -hmm. with a certification and we've not seen that. Um, but now I think, I think it makes sense to hire people mm -hmm. so that we, you know, we do our screening and we hire who we think will be a good fit for the program. Um, and, you know, they may not have a lot of experience, but they have a desire, um, to, to make this a career or they have a desire to work. Mm -hmm. And so, and then we enter into their system and register them and, you know, put down the all the things they need to know, which is not cumbersome by any means. And that's that's it. At the end of the year, um, we'll let DOL know that they have completed and DOL will then issue the certifications. So Great. Now, and <laughs> as Wade was telling me, um, and as you mentioned that President talked about apprenticeship in his State of the Union last night, um, apprenticeships overall are booming nationwide. Um, Mr. Johnson gave me these stats to share with the network that there's over 26,000 registered apprenticeship programs. Um, there's over 600,000 active apprentices. We have had 55,000 or more new apprentices since January 1st of 2021. So apprenticeship is booming despite the pandemic um, and over 2,000 new programs since January 1 of 2021. So this is definitely um, a growth market. All right, so here's some links to access um, the information that we talked about today. I'd like to go back and see if we have any other additional questions um, from the network, from our participants. And unfortunately, since I'm screen sharing, I can't actually see your beautiful faces. So I'll be counting on Steph to let me know if anyone raises their hands or puts anything in the chat. Um, Amy, to go back, there was a, a question that asked if Carla's program was going through the DOL Youth Works. 
or if there was another program? Um, I think I know the answer, but I'll defer to Carla. Um, Amy, go ahead, because I, Steph, I'm not sure I understood that. I, I'm not sure I heard the question. Amy, do you want to go? Um, um, yes, as far as I know, it's not affiliated with YouthWorks. In, in my background research, the, um, the YouthWorks program is a, is a separate um, set of initiatives. So this is not affiliated with YouthWorks. It sounds like it could be from what I understand, but I'm not also not a workforce development expert. Um, but from what I could see on the Department of Labor and the Workforce Development Board websites, the youth uh, programs are separate. Yes, I, I agree too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, one question I wanted to ask you, Carla, which I didn't have a chance to articulate in advance. I'm just very curious to know how this program dovetails with some of the other workforce programs that are housed at NECAC, because in poking around your website, I saw that you also have a skill up program and you have something called EYE, which seems to be uh, like a soft skills training program. But I think I haven't heard you mention integrating those programs with this program. Um, we do have both those programs and they're operated by our community um, initiatives, community development um, outreach programs. So we certainly work with them. Um, they have not had anyone at this point that was interested or felt, you know, that this was the area that they would do best in, but we certainly work with them. Um, NECAC you know, works, we, we try to bring all of our programs together and work together as a cohesive group to best serve our clients. Great, and I do see a couple of questions in the chat. Um, how many apprentices do you have at any given time and how many do you hire at the end of the year? I think, as we know, you've hired four so far and it's a rolling, and, rolling um, recruitment, right? It is a rolling recruitment. And so we hire them up front. Mm -hmm. So we've hired four that are in the program now. Our goal is to um, hire 30 people. And as I said, we're trying to hire probably in the next few months, we hope to hire 10 and then not have, and maybe bring another 20 on after July, August. Um, but so it is a rolling number, it is a rolling admission number, but all of them are hired up front by NECAC. Um, and Catherine Riley Harrington asked, how are you prepared to prevent an up and out phenomenon similar to what we experience with high school teachers? You know, I don't know that we're prepared. Um, I don't know that um, with Head Start, yes. Oh, Head Start. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, Catherine, that we, we are prepared for that. That's why we really are working very hard to, to stress that this is a career, that they have opportunities for advancement, um, all of those things that this just isn't a job. Now, you know, we may talk that, but someone has to feel that, that, that that's what they want to do. Um, I'm old enough and been here long enough to have been through Aura. And, um, and so we had very much, very much that, that syndrome. Um, but we also kept some really good employees from that too. So my answer is, Catherine, I, I don't know that we're prepared, but we're doing everything we can to try to encourage it, mm -hmm. um, them to stay. Right. And of course, um, up and out isn't necessarily a bad thing, because if we're touting the weatherization program as a workforce development, like a jobs program overall, and we're promoting the idea that this is a, a career that these positions lead to upward mobility, careers that have upward mobility. Long term, especially on behalf of community action, we want our recruits to move up. We want them to, to be improving. So we it's the too. kind of program which, um, you know, like you're going to measure success and failure at the same time, right? Absolutely. And, you know, we, we said that when they get this certification, the certification is important because if they do move, the certification they have to show their next employer of what, you know, when they apply for a weatherization job or a construction job. So it's important for them. Um, you know, we, uh, we would love to keep all of our good employees, but we're, we're realists knowing that 
you know, people, it's a mobile society and people mm-hmm. can move. Um, I saw real quickly one come up about partnership with the local trades. We have partnered for years with the, um, the joint apprenticeship program of the Carpenters Union and have another program that we're doing or working on to build homes. Um, and so, yes, we've also had a partnership with the Sheet Metal Workers Union. So, yes, we do try to partner with the trades. Absolutely. I'm also seeing a few additional questions about how you pay the apprentices. So what funds are used to pay and what is your top wage for laborers and leaders, um, crew leaders? So I would like to, I know in other um, scenarios, there's been quite a bit of interest in how you um, allocate wage costs within a particular job. And I think that you're prepared to talk about that. I am prepared to talk about that. Um, again, they're an employee of NECAC. So they fill out a, an electronic timesheet and they show the hours of, you know, on this job they, they work, it was a LIHEAP job or this job was a combination LIHEAP and DOE or, you know, Ameren, Missouri or whatever mm-hmm. it was. They, they break that time down on their timesheet. Um, and so we're, these, the apprentice, these apprentices are employees of NECAC first. And so they break it down just like every other employee does. And that's how we then, um, you know, get reimbursement or seek reimbursement from the state. And that is a good model. I've definitely heard from other agencies that do that the same way. I'm not 100% sure if all agencies have that sophisticated timekeeping system. So is, if anyone on the call today would like to share how they keep time and whether or not if they have, if they would have a challenge doing it that way, that would be helpful because um, we're all here to learn from each other. And we've got some good comments coming in too um, from our friends at IREC. They shared two different useful links. There's a link to a model program and then also a link to information about veterans in registered apprenticeship programs. Carla, I know you said, um, Some of your recruits have come from word of mouth. So some of your existing staff brought their friends in. Um, Have you done any outreach with veterans? That's always an important um, population to keep in mind for everybody. Um, We actually have some veteran programs. Um, We have some funding from HUD to do veterans rehab. Um, And so, you know, I don't know that we've um, specifically done outreach, but we certainly have talked to um, veterans and other people about the the opening. So I don't know that we've specifically done it, but I think in what we do, we've we've reached out. Okay, and another question from Stephanie. Um, Are you able to waive any pre-hire requirements for apprenticeship candidates, i.e. diploma, GED, background screenings? Um, No. um, Right now, we don't mandate they have to have a, a GED or a high school diploma but we do do background screenings and we do um, a drug test. And no, we've not weighed those background. Does having the, uh, the, the position registered with the Department of Labor as an apprenticeship program come with any specific requirements? I would think that the requirements that you have to have people do DOE weatherization are probably more stringent than anything else. Yeah, DOL did not. That really is up to the mm-hmm. the registered apprenticeship program. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would say that we've not waived those background checks and we've not waived the, the drug test because we're sending people into to homes. They're driving vehicles owned by the agency. Um, and so, no, we have not waived those. Mm-hmm. A uh, question from Xavier, how do you get apprentices excited about the mission? You know, I've been around a long time and so mission is paramount to me. Um, we do um, new hire, new employee orientation at our agency. And part of that new employee orientation is the history and the mission of community action. Um, so that they are, they and I, I remember talking to a bunch of new employees just recently that you're part of a bigger movement. You're part of something that 
you know, makes a difference in the lives of people. This just isn't a job. This is a mission. And I just had one young man who started out, um, will complete his, his one year in um, May of this year. And he said, I said, what do you really like about the job? And he said, helping people, mm -hmm. helping people. So I think it, it is just part of who you are as a community action agency that, you know, we need to, we need to stress that to every new employee that they're part of something bigger um, and that they're the future. That's a great question. And now, since I've um, had you on for quite a while, Carla, I'm going to hit you with possibly a more difficult question. Um, oh, as, no. as we know, uh, NASCASP every year does a wage survey. And so we look at the level of, well, I guess they don't do that every year, but this year um, they did a survey looking at the, the wages that are paid to weatherization workers. We have a question in the chat weatherization dollars are hard to compete with booming trades industry. And I think we addressed that in one of our slides, like other trades are paying more. And so weatherization as a whole is a little bit wage challenged. And in one of our previous um, webinars, we did have an, another agency talk about how they used utility dollars to boost wages for the weatherization crews. And with your portfolio of utility and LIHEAP dollars, are you using any of that or is there any hope to use that to increase wages? Because you said that you've already been able to go from 13 to hopefully 16. Yeah, we use all of our programs as part of that, that pool of money that um, the employees are paid from in weatherization. And so, yes, we are, we are taking to our board um, increases for every single um, one of our employees in the weatherization program the end of this month. Um, we looked at where people are adjusted current people to get in line with what we're, you know, bringing new people in at. Um, we did look at NASCAPs and, and what they're, what they looked at as an average. And so we're trying to adjust, um, and that includes office staff. Um, that includes everyone in the program. Mm -hmm. um, we recognize that we can't compete at where we are now, but you know, there is a limit to what we can do. We, we're never going to compete with $24 an hour, um, but we can be more competitive. And that's what we're striving to be. And I'm sure like we talked about, two of the most important competitive pieces are the community action mission, right? You're helping people um, and you're doing good works and the ability to grow. So knowing that you're embarking on a career, you're not just working at McDonald's, not, not to, not to put down working at McDonald's, but I think there's more the, I think the career arc in fast food and retail is a little bit different than in this kind of work. I think that's, that's true. Um, and I think, you know, the career is very important. I think the four 10 hour days are helpful. I, I think people like that. Um, we have a, a wonderful benefit package Mm -hmm. But if you're young, you know, 100% paid health insurance at somebody my age sounds really good. Um, if you're really young, you may not think it sounds as good uh, because you don't view you're going to get sick. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we've tried really hard to, to market those benefits, but recognizing that, you know, not everybody is concerned about that as maybe someone older like me, um, we have uh, lots of paid holidays, we have annual leave, sick leave, but um, we've been marketing that for years. Um, and so now we're looking at marketing in a different way. And I think the career is a really important way to market it. Okay, and we have another question, which I'm excited about in the chat. Um, Catherine, thank you for all the good questions. <laughs> She's asking, is SNAP ENT an available funding source for this? So I will, ask Carla to answer that, but I'm also going to ask Steph Smith from NCAP to chime in because she is the head of our SNAP ENT project here at NCAP. Well, my answer is um, we've not looked at SNAP um, um, employment and training money, so um, I'll be interested to hear what Steph has to say too. I would say you should. <laughs> um, yeah, so where SNAP would 
probably be really beneficial is um, I saw that you, you're you already working with um, the WIOA legislation, which is great. They, they partner very well. Um, but once you become a SNAP ENT partner in your state, um, SNAP dollars on a 50% reimbursement model can pay for transportation, books, boots, uniforms, um, you know, dependent care. So kind of all those gaps and the barriers that may prevent someone, um, let's say you're holding you know, a construction class at your local community college or technical college, if there's a, a barrier to getting, physically getting there with transportation, SNAP dollars can fill, can fill in. So um, obviously I'm partial, but I would say explore an ENT partnership with your state HHS office. And if you're interested in finding out more about that, don't hesitate to reach out to the National Partnership, um, either myself or Steph. Steph can put her contact information in yeah. the chat. She's more than happy to help walk you through that. Um, I see some comments in the chat about the restrictions of the savings to investment ratio in the ability to cover wages. And I would welcome anybody who has a comment to come on camera and discuss that out loud. I know that this is a really hot topic. Myself, as an individual, I'm still wrapping my mind around this, but I understand that from the network's perspective, um, the savings to investment ratio is a bigger constraint in overall operations than the average cost per unit. And I know that NCAP in partnership with NCAF has circulated a list of recommendations to um, Congress as well as the Department of Energy. And we're looking at overhauling the way that the well, raising the ACPU and overhauling the way that the SIR is calculated. Um, and so if you would like to spend time talking about that on today's call, that's great. I don't mind going off topic because it's all related, right? I don't want, oh, I, I don't want to take up Carla's time, but um, yeah, um, and it's not necessarily doing away with or reducing the SIR, but finding, um, different ways to um, come up with that SIR. To me, the SIR has always been the proof that weatherization was an effective um, program, um, that we were you know, saving as much money as we were spending. Um, so I really don't want to see the SIR go away, but um, would really like to be able to find some way to put in non-energy benefits um, uh, to add those into it so that we can get um, more value in that 1.0 SI SIR. Mm -hmm. uh, question, are the educational hours included within their 40-hour work week or do they complete those hours separately, Carla? No, it's included in their 40-hour work week. Mm -hmm. Um, from a structural standpoint, how do you lay that out? So when you hire an apprentice, they have classroom hours and OJT hours. Do you do like a day in the classroom here and a day there? Or do you do like a contiguous block of classroom hours followed by OJT? No, we, we do. It depends on, you know, we, we start out with on the job training, then we may do some classroom and then some more OJT. So it it's not a contiguous, it's not all the classrooms done at first and then the OJT. No, it's done periodically throughout mm -hmm. the year. Um, and there's a question, how does the probationary period work? Are there two probationary periods, one after the apprentice training and another after they're hired? Are they hired upon completion? Please elaborate. That's from Daryl Johnson. Yeah, they're hired at the beginning. And so their probationary period starts when they're hired and then entered into the registered apprenticeship program. So first they're hired by NECAC. They go through our probationary period, which is 90 days. Um, and so at the end of 90 days and everything's going well, they're, you know, they, they continue on as an employee of NECAC. Mm -hmm. So it's all done at the, at the very front when they're hired. 
And Carla, I have a question about your wait list. Um, it sounded like a lot of, I think you said 450 homes or 415 on the wait list. Are those homes that have already been inspected or are those people who, in other words, how many of those could eventually turn into deferrals? Are those vetted that you know the work will be done? No, those are people who are on the waiting list who have not, the, their, their points, they haven't mm -hmm. reached the, you know, we're not to get to, we're not where we need to get to them yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so there could be some deferrals in that. We don't defer a lot of homes. Um, mm -hmm. We have a lot of other funding sources um, in terms of rehab. Mm -hmm. So that if we encounter a leaking roof, um, and that would be deferred. We come in with our rehab programs and, and you know, fix the roof or that, put a new roof on. Right. And that's one of the reasons why I brought that up, because when we're talking about um, non-DOE funds that are less restricted, um, all of our agencies have to decide how much they can spend. I mean, theoretically, you could use some of those to increase wages, but if you have a huge deferral burden, um, agencies have to decide if they're going to divert those dollars to to do deferral reduction, deferral yeah. mitigation measures. Absolutely. We decided a long time ago when we went into getting a lot of home rehab dollars and we have USDA dollars and we have um, home dollars, we have trust fund dollars in the state of Missouri. Um, we made a decision that we weren't going to let things stand in the way of people being able to get their homes weatherized. Now, do we have enough dollars to meet all the needs? You never have enough dollars to meet all the needs, right? Um, but we don't defer a lot of homes, um, especially for leaking roofs or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. There could be other reasons. You know, what we say is about 10% of the people on the waiting list are probably when we get their name, when their name comes up, may have moved. Um, aren't interested anymore, can't be contacted. So about 10% of those will be people that we just simply, you know, can't get hold of or, or they've, they've completely moved out of the area. Um, but a lot of those people will be people that will move forward and be audited and get weatherization based on years of experience with our waiting list. We have always had a large waiting list at NECAC. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think sometimes, you know, we worried about it because, you know, people were waiting a long time to get services. But um, we're very grateful now with additional dollars coming that, you know, we're going to be able to reach more people. And Carla, another question. Um, do you utilize DOE training and technical assistance funds for your apprenticeship hours? Um, we haven't, the TNTA dollars, yes, we will utilize them. Um, we utilize, we've done some online classes. Hopefully we're gonna get back to maybe going to some classes, um, going to some training this year, but yes, we will use DOE and DNR TNTA dollars, yes. And that would be, are you saying that would sort of be supplemental to your, to the core apprenticeship um, to the curriculum? Classes. Yeah. The yes. Great. Well, thank you everyone for your time. I'm, oh, there's another question coming in. The trainers used to train the apprentices. Are they from your weatherization field staff? And what are the impacts to them dedicating the time to train students as well as perform your weatherization services? Well, it is our crew leaders on our crews that will train them just like they would any other employee mm -hmm. that starts as a brand new employee. Um, we have three man crews, um, oh, three person crews. Um, and so they will train them just like any other employee um, as a crew leader. And aside from the new hires, how many weatherization staff do you have? Oh, Amy, I didn't count that. Um, <laughs> I know we didn't enumer enumerate we didn't that. that. Um, let's see. I'm going to roughly guess because I don't want to just spend, you know, time here trying to think of everybody's name and counting them. I'm going to say 17, 18 right now. Okay. I mean, I can't emphasize enough that I'm impressed 
that you as an agency are running a training program, even though you're not a weatherization training center, right? So right. there are official weatherization training centers, um, and you don't have formal, you don't have trainers, you just have crews. We don't. We have crew leaders who act as our trainers in the field. Mm -hmm. Yes, so no. And how did they feel? I would imagine, I'm curious to know, how did they feel about launching the apprenticeship program and being asked to start doing classroom hours? Are you, was that something they were already doing or were they open to it? Well, our weatherization director will probably do more of the classroom hours along with our auditors and QCIs, but they were excited about. The other thing is that we've been, we've been an apprentice registered apprenticeship program now for one year. We can now register existing employees into the apprenticeship program. They've already had their training and will receive their certification. So oh, retroactively. Retroactively. That's um, exciting. So we have the opportunity for all of our employees to get that certification. Um, I'm curious to know, are, how far away are people coming to, to take these jobs? Well, are they all from the immediate area or are they driving from outside of your service territory? Um, we just hired a, a young man last year, one of our, one of, in, in the, the first class of registered apprentices. He comes from um, a little town in Illinois, um, which, you know, is borders us not too far away, but about an hour and a half he drives and he's our farthest. Great. Um, Lori Johnson is asking, are your crews centrally located or do you have a crew in each county, which is a good question. And on that, I would like to piggyback, do you ever share your crews with other agencies in the state? Um, we're centrally located. Our crews come out of Bowling Green. That's where our warehouse is. That's where our trucks are. They start from our Bowling Green office each day um, and go out to the 12 counties we serve. Um, with an influx of new money, we're looking at setting up a second warehouse, and that might be in one of our southern counties and starting crews, you know, from the south and crews from Bowling Green, but we've not made that determination yet. We did that during Aura, and um, it had some positive things, and it had some things that weren't so positive. Um, so, but no, they all start from a central location. And Amy, what was then? Do we loan out our crews? Mm -hmm. um, no, we have not. We are so busy that um, no, we have not. Okay. And then given the staff shortage that some, like some of our network report that contractors have staff shortages, have you had to alter, have you had to make any changes in the way that you use your crews versus your contractors? No, like I said, we really have only used contractors to do our, our clean and tins and our mm -hmm. furnace installations. And then we hired a person um, that's certified to do all of that. And he's been doing the bulk of it for us. Um, we recognize he won't be able to do that with the large influx of money that we're projecting. And we'll have to go back to using furnace vendors um, on a more regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the biggest issue is the supply chain and getting, you know, materials. Yeah. Prompt bases, windows, furnaces. Um, you know, as all of you know, they do weatherization. That's a, that's a huge issue. Okay, and we have another question from Melanie. Um, how do you recruit to ensure an equitable and diverse set of apprentices, like in terms of race, gender, and other vulnerable communities? Um, well, you know, we're a community action agency, so we certainly look at all of that. We, we, um, we recruit, um, we do the standard Indeed, that kind of thing. We um, put our flyers out or our notices out to all of our county outreach centers um, so that we reach um, the populations that are the most vulnerable um, and need these jobs desperately um, and want to, would love this as a career. Um, we, we reach out with the Workforce for Investment Board, mm -hmm. um, the, the, as I said, the Tech Center. So we do our very best to try to reach 
people who are really underserved and, and the most vulnerable in our communities. Um, do you do any outreach or recruitment in other languages besides English? I know in many circles, there's a lot of extra focus on working with immigrant communities. Um, we have we have tried to do that with a span with a Spanish speaking population. That is our biggest um, population of um, immigrants. Um, you know, we're starting to see um, some some movement of some. You know, um, I think we'll see some Ukrainians. I think we'll see some diversity, but not as much as we have seen with, we have a large Hispanic population mm -hmm. in some of our areas. So yeah, we've tried. I, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the demographics of your service territory, since we have a national audience and um, myself, I'm not entirely certain what Northeast Missouri's demographics are. I think we, some of us might have a tendency to think of, it as being predominantly white, but I know in rural areas there are large sure. immigrant populations. It is predominantly white in the rural areas. Um, you know, is it cheese time? Huh? Is it cheese time? Cheese time? Huh? Is it cheese time? Okay, let's go get cheese. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling to find a button that says ask to, to mute or ask to mute, and I can't find either. Go ahead, Carla. Well, I'll just persevere on. Um, it is predominantly white in the, in the rural areas, but we have three urban counties. Um, the Hispanic population has been growing for a number of years in especially the more urban counties, uh, not so much in the rural counties. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have saw some some relocation of, of persons from Bosnia, from Afghanistan, uh, but we don't have a lot of diversity in terms of immigrant population. Uh, I wish we did, uh, but we don't. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've had a, a large um, Hispanic population for many years. And so we try, um, we, you know, I, I said we do other programs. We try to put flyers into, you know, into Spanish. Uh, We've done a lot of home ownership work in the Hispanic population with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Um, and so, you know, we, we try diligently to reach out in our communities. Um, and that's the advantage of community action. You know, mm -hmm. who does communities better than community action? Um, we also had a question about are any folks in the apprenticeship receiving SNAP? And I'd like to expand on that because we talked about the wages. We know that from, from our preliminary analysis, some of the WAP wages nationwide are low enough that the uh, weatherization crews could also qualify, could meet the income qualifications for weatherization itself. And we're also curious, I'm curious about the overlap with Medicaid in some states. And so are you screening your applicants to find out if they're currently receiving other financial assistance? Um, you mentioned the health insurance. Are any of your staffers declining the health insurance because they're still using Medicaid? No, no, none of them have declined because they're using Medicaid. Um, no, we don't ask the question about SNAP. I will tell you that we had, um, one young man that we hired um, that didn't tell us this at first, but he had been living in his van mm -hmm. and coming to work every single day um, on time, um, a great worker. Um, and one day just happened to tell one of his coworkers that it was really hard living in your van. Um, and so we were able to um, actually find him an apartment in one of the uh, complexes that we own and manage. Um, we didn't have a long waiting list and he came up very quickly once we got his application and, you know, we got him into stable housing, but. Um, That's a success story. It is a success story. And, and again, it's community action at its very best, but, you know, I think, um, you know, you're right that people struggle every day and he just simply could not afford any housing, which is a whole another subject and another webinars and another topics about affordable housing and the lack of it. And so he worked full time and couldn't afford to, to rent anywhere. And we have affordable housing in 
you know, where his, the rent was what he could do. Um, but on the market, he couldn't find anything he could afford. Um, so even with his wages in the apprenticeship, he qualified for a housing subsidy? He didn't, he qualified to go into a low income housing. Yes, he did. Yes. Will he be able to stay there even if his wages increase? Yeah, it's a tax credit property. Um, so unless you hit a, a certain milestone in income, as long as you stay in the unit that you're in and don't move into another one, you qualify if you were eligible when you moved in. Mm -hmm. That's encouraging. Are you trying to recruit um, job applicants from any of the other programs that you administer? Like, are you looking at Head Start parents or recipients of other programs that may need a job? Um, we, don't, we don't operate Head Start. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Course, but of course, um, we, would, we, uh, we don't provide our flyers now to Head Start when we're recruiting, and, and that's a good idea that we should. Mm -hmm. um, we post any job openings that we have at all of our apartment complexes that were within a, you know, 30 mile radius from Bowling Green. Great. It looks like the questions are quieting down. Any last questions from anybody on the call? I really appreciate everyone sticking around. I like to point out that the Q&A portion is always my favorite part of any webinar because I really appreciate the dialogue. I will be sending